Robin. I'm coming to you from the east coast of the United States uh, in North Carolina. And it is the week before Thanksgiving here in the States. So there's a ton of things going on. But I figured if I didn't squeeze in a small podcast before Thanksgiving break, it was not going to happen probably ever again in 2017. So uh, my son, uh, my youngest son and my husband are out at a Boy Scout event. The house is quiet. I have 10,000 things going on. There's laundry in the washing machine. I've been preparing baking most of the weekend. The toilets have a toilet bowl cleaner in them because I gotta go scrub toilets. We've got company coming, so I've got lots to do, but I thought I'd take a minute to try and film a podcast and see if I could get it up this week. So as I said, my name is Robin, and um, you can find me on Instagram as Willow Caroline and on Ravelry as The Flock, and I have a website that has all the show notes on it, uh, Mama Flock Knits. Uh, my last name is Lamb, which is the whole reason for the flock um, being my username, and I, I like the play on, play on the word lamb. And I'm a knitter and a sewer, sewist. I'm not sure I like that word, sewist. But anyway, I like to sew, I like to knit, I like to, I'm very domestic. But in my daytime life, I am also a math teacher. I teach in the International Baccalaureate program at the local high school, and that keeps me very, very busy. So, last time I podcasted was before Rhinebeck, and I did get to go to Rhinebeck for the first time with my cousin Hannah stayed with her in New York, and that was lovely to experience something totally different from where I live. Um, enjoyed her neighborhood and walking everywhere and the subway, it was just, it was a lot of fun. And then we had an adorable cabin with some friends of hers up near Rhinebeck, and we spent Saturday um, at Rhinebeck at the actual festival. And so that was a great deal of fun. I. Since it was my first time going, I um, tried to keep my expectations very low in terms of what I plan to do. Um, and that advice came from Kelly, Celtic Cast On podcast. She went to Rhinebeck one year and she had a video, a podcast afterwards with a friend. They talked about the Rhinebeck experience and I just got the, the gist of it that Rhinebeck could be very overwhelming and indeed it could be. I think both Hannah and myself said at some point at the end of the weekend that we were we were yarned out, which seems hard to believe, but at a certain point we we had had plenty. So I just went with no real expectations. I didn't have a long list of things I needed to do or see, um, very minimal list of things I was looking for, and it made it very enjoyable. I had a great time. I did manage to say hello to the yarn hoarder when I saw her in a stall. I didn't introduce myself. I didn't take a selfie. I just said hello, <laughs> enjoy your podcast, and moved on. Um, because it hit me at some point that these are people that while I enjoy watching them, they also were there for the same reason that I was, to enjoy the festival itself. And I didn't want to intrude too much on their day. Um, I also got to bump into and say hello to um, an Instagram person that I enjoy following, and that was Mimi Ing Ingwright. Um, so I got to bump into her and say hello to her and meet somebody in real life that I only see through my screen. So that was fun. We missed the Ravelry Roundup. Um, we, we didn't... I didn't pay attention to times or anything. I hadn't really thought of, thought about planning the day out. So between the two of us, we sort of missed out on that. But it was okay. I mean, it was fun. It was good food, lots of beautiful yarn, and it was a lovely experience. 
So I thought I'd share with you what I got at Rhinebeck quickly, briefly, and partly because one of my first finished objects and about the only finished object I have right now is something that was a result of a purchase I made at the festival. My whole goal was to see if I could find some speckly sock yarn different than what I can buy in my local yarn shop. And beyond that, I didn't really have a plan or any expectations. And to try to keep myself under control. And I think I succeeded in that. So the first thing that I purchased from Gail's Art is some hand-dyed sock yarn in a, what I feel like is a very Christmassy colorway. And conveniently enough, it is also named Peppermint Candy. So they felt it was a Christmassy colorway too. But I thought um, while I was looking if I could find something that looked like Christmas socks, then that would be something I would purchase. And ta-da! Some beautiful peppermint candy Christmas sock. Sock yarn. It is a super wash blue face wool and nylon uh, four ply. Um, Wonder Sock is their base, and again, it's Gale's Art, hand-dyed yarn and fiber. And I thought it looked really beautiful, and it does have some speckly bits to it, and so I was very excited. And I can't wait to find some time to cast it on. Maybe this will be a Christmas Eve kind of cast on. I don't know. But Christmas socks at some point. I was also on the lookout for some potential sock yarn for my son. He mentioned at some point that he would love for me to knit him some socks. Um, my middle son seems to get a lot of hand knits, but that's because he asks for them. So if he asks for them, I'm going to oblige. And he, he thought it would be kind of cool to have some socks in his school colors, which are a, a particular kind of orange and purple for Clemson University. So I did come across this sock yarn, which I really, really love <laughs> for myself, um, just because it's just a crazy combination of purple and yellow and orange, and I think it will be fun to knit up in socks. And because the yarn itself is so, it's, it's fat, squishy yarn. Um, this came from Schweitzer's Fiber Mill, and it just seemed like it was the perfect candidate. It's super wash merino. Um, it fits in with the school colors. You know, I can hear my, my washing machine singing to me, saying, <laughs> Get busy, woman. You have things to do. Um, anyway, so I think when he's home for Thanksgiving, I'll run it by him. See if it floats his boat, and if it doesn't, fine with me. There'll be socks for me. But it is, it's a very, very fat um, sock wool. Very squishy. So I'm excited to see how that knits up. And then I found, the other thing I thought I might like to find would be some self-striping yarn. And um, that led us, uh, there were quite a few, there were so many booths, and there's so much beautiful yarn. And you could always tell which booths were the most popular because there were people for miles, and it was packed and squished. Um, and one of those places where I persevered to buy yarn instead of just going, ah, walk by, um, was the Into the World um, booth. And I got two colorways of yarn. Uh, both purple. Again, I, I, I was sort of looking for purple and orange, that combination for my son, but purple is something I like as well, and so that was on my mind. But I found these two colorways at Into the World. This one is a self-striping yarn that knits up into some beautiful, beautiful um, thin stripes that I can't wait to um, knit with. This is called Pink Elephant. It's a super wash merino nylon hand painted Pococo sock yarn. Anyway, Pink Elephant, and it has the dark pink and light pink and light gray and dark gray. 
So I got that. And then I got this too because this just seemed like it would knit up into a fun, uh, crazy kind of pattern. But it's also purple and gray and some green and some blue and some white. And this is called Mariadoc. And so four sock yarns came home with me and that was it. Um, I thought I did quite well. Brought home some treasures. Didn't blow the budget. And I have things to look forward to and good memories to knit into that. The things that we did, the food that we ate. Great fish and chip shop in Brooklyn that we found. I think it was in Brooklyn. Uh, went over the Brooklyn, walked over the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, ate momos from a place in her neighborhood. Um, spent time with her young daughter. It was it was fun. It was a great great trip. So the Rhinebeck, the day at Rhinebeck was sort of the icing on the cake and the purpose for the trip, but the whole trip was quite lovely. And it felt deliciously wicked to play hooky from school. <laughs> that felt really great. But I did also purchase something that I didn't go looking for. It just, one of the first booths that we went to um, was showcasing not only yarn, but um, fabric that had been dyed, naturally dyed. And so I bought fabric, it's linen, and it was a, a kit for making a skirt. So it came with a pattern for making a skirt. It's a very simple skirt. But the best part of the linen is that it is dyed with indigo and black walnut. And I have a giant black walnut tree in my front yard, and we have walnut trees all over our property. Those black walnuts are treacherous. When they fall in the fall, they either bonk you on the head or you twist your ankle when you <laughs> walk on them. And the cases, um, when it rains, the hard cases, that, or the soft cases surrounding the nut itself, just kind of dissolve into this brown squishy mush which we have to rake up and and keep out of the path in the front yard and when the boys were young we would try to uh, crack the nuts and harvest the meat and enjoy that but it's a bear to get into a black walnut and it's it's not it's not easy the man who owned the land when we moved on to the property uh, 21 years ago said he used to ride his, drive his tractor over the nuts to get them to crack. That was his method, which I don't know. Do you really want to eat a nut after it's been driven over by a tractor? I don't know. But he also said that the black walnuts they used to save and use for hair dye. And I believe it. And I know people die with it. And so if you ever need a source of black walnuts, come to my house and I will be happy to give you all you can handle. But in any case, this is a beautiful um, bluish, grayish, brownish uh, linen fabric. And it made this kind of wrap skirt, which I'm going to see if I can show you the, the pattern idea without giving too much away. Um, But it wraps around in such a way that it makes this sort of pleated fold here. And so it's not really a wrap around skirt per se. You don't have to worry about it flying open when the wind catches you. But it is a wrap around. And you can wear the, the, the opening in the front or here on the side. And it's very comfortable to wear. I, I um, found it very quick and easy to follow the directions and make the skirt. And I have loved already wearing this skirt. I bought it because I thought it went beautifully with the Lady Brunswick sweater, which I think was finished and shown. I'm pretty sure I showed it to you last time. Um, but this is the sweater that I ended up wearing to Rhinebeck. And it goes really well. Well, this is not... <sighs> Let's see here. There's a skirt, and there's a sweater. <clears throat> Can you tell that they go together? I don't know if that was useful. In any case, I was wearing the sweater at Rhinebeck, and saw the fabric and thought, well, that'll look nice together, and it does look nice together. And um, it's comfortable to wear. 
this is really soft, um, not cotton, but it feels like cotton. It's not cotton. This is Malabrigo. And if you've ever knit with Malabrigo, you know how soft and squishy it, it is and how enjoyable it is to wear. Malabrigo, nice and soft. And then this really comfy linen skirt. So, first finished object is this linen skirt. Very simple to put together. And if I pull it out of the wash and just hang it up like this, yes, it's a little wrinkly, but it's okay with me. I'm, I'm not looking for that really crisp look with this particular item of clothing. Mostly comfort. So it was really funny to me to go to New York and hear how everybody was talking about the weather and how it was too warm for sweaters. And I did wear my sweater. Um, it is, it's three quarter length sleeve. Um, and it's, but it's a tunic. And I wore my sweater and received several lovely compliments on it, which was really sweet. But I also received a lot of, how can you be wearing that? Well, I'm from the South. When it gets below 70, we wear sweaters. <laughs> we get cold. We don't know what to do with the, the cool breeze. And I found it comfortable to wear that all day, with the exception of a few moments in time that had little to do with the um, the actual temperature of the weather outside. It was more the heat of the people in the building. There are so many people. And then, yeah, got a little warm. But for the most part, I was not uncomfortable. I wasn't itchy and prickly with that kind of heat you get when you're um, overly warm. So it was lovely to wear my sweater, my Rhinebeck sweater, even though I think most everybody else had abandoned theirs at that point. So, skirt, first finished object. Second finished object, I think, since the last podcast, was my three color cashmere shawl. I don't remember where I was on this. I don't think it was finished. But I also, but I was really eager to get it finished because I had heard the weather was going to be warm and I wanted to get it done in time to wear it with me at Rhinebeck. So I did. I had this on top of that sweater. <laughs> I looked all bundled up. People must have thought I was nuts. But this is my three color cashmere shawl by Hohi Locatelli. It's made with Brooklyn Tweed, not loft, Veil. Veil is the um, lace weight version. And I've worn it to school several times as well. And it's exactly what I hoped it would be. So the pattern itself, I think, is knit, um, supposed to be knit with a, um, a fingering weight yarn instead of a lace weight yarn. And Veil is lace weight, but it has a nice squish to it. It has a thickness to it, so it doesn't feel um, so fragile. But it's nice to just be able to throw something on and look knitterly without being overly hot. It drapes really beautifully. Um, it drapes beautifully and quickly when you're in front of the mirror at, getting ready for work. Um, but anyway, I'm not sure what's going on with the camera, but it just cut off. But I was talking about my veil shawl. Um, glad to have gotten it finished, finding it very wearable, very soft and cozy without being overly hot, which is what I need. Um, the classroom that I teach in is very, very warm, and then you put 32 students in there and you're baking. So um, this allows me to feel seasonal without... Um, without sweating to death. It turned out really, really lovely, and I enjoyed it. So if you want more information about this project, you can go to my um, website, Mama Flock Knits, and look at, um, get the link to my Ravelry page where it's up, listed as a project, and you can read all about the yarn and, and everything there. So that is a finished object since last time. And then I think everything else is sort of just had some progress made on it. I am starting to think about gift knitting. And so I am using the Yarn Hoarders um, hat pattern to knit my son. My oldest son is a Dallas Cowboys fan. 
and I am knitting him a winter hat because he asked me, he was, last winter he's like, oh, you knit for Eli, why didn't you knit me a hat? Well, okay, didn't know you wanted a hat. Um, I'm happy to knit you a hat. So it's got a kind of dark yarn here, so it's a little bit hard to see, but it's got a nice um, rib cuff and then just the stripes and gray and white. And my youngest son and I are having a debate about pom-pom. I think we've decided a small pom-pom. If you go to the Yarn Hoarder site or go to my website where the show notes will be, I will put up um, a link to her pattern. Um, she has these nice giant pom-poms on top, but we couldn't decide if, if Zach was a big pom-pom or small pom-pom person. And I might rope his girlfriend in at Thanksgiving and ask her what she thinks. But this would be um, Christmas knitting done. It just needs to have it tied off and maybe a pom-pom made and then blocked. And I'll be ahead of the game. So this is being knit out of Patton's classic worsted wool. Um, I don't know the names of the colors. Gray is, it's called Gray Mix. And then Marine, the navy is Marine. And then I think the white was left over from something else, so I don't know. <laughs> don't know what where the white came from, but natural or white or something like that. So this is practically a finished object. Then, in my sock knitting bag, there is a half finished object. I finished my first striped sock. So if you have watched the podcast before, you know I made a pair of socks like this for my husband. Only he, he had um, the cuff and the toe made out of the same yarn as the, this heel and the stripes. So my husband went to the Netherlands last December, about a year ago now, and brought back for some yarn gifts for me for Christmas. And this was a crazy Zauber ball that he found in the yarn shop um, that I really enjoyed, uh, knitting him a pair of socks that look just like this, except they have different, um, they have the dark toe and cuff. But I wanted to be able to tell them apart. I have really big feet. Not quite as big as his, but big feet, and when you're pulling them out of the the sink, I wanted to be able to tell whose was whose, so I left mine natural. And again, if you want more details about these socks, because I've talked about them before, um, you can go to my Ravelry page and take a look. So they're turning out well. I have not yet cast on for the second sock, but I am excited. By weight, I should have plenty to finish my second sock, and I will have gotten two pairs of socks out of the Zauber Ball, and then I'm using Coop Knits Soxia Gray yarn for the alternating stripes. So that's pretty exciting. And then, um, because I don't have a lot of just sit down and knit time anymore, not like I do in the summer, uh, I have been trying to make a point of having a project next to my bed and I get in bed and I watch a few minutes of a podcast and I knit on something. And so lately, my TV knitting, if I'm sitting down actually watching TV, that has been Christmas sock or Christmas gift focused. But that, you know, 10 minutes that I knit in bed before I'm just about to pass out, um, it's nice to have a sock there. So this is a Barocco sock yarn, comfort sock I think is what it's called. Um, I've shown you before but now I finally have gotten around to doing the heel and I did an Aya Partridge um, Aya Partridge heel and I've made the turn and I finished the decreasing decreases and so I'm now just knitting knitting knitting. Um, and it's amazing what you can get done in, in 10 minutes. Um, the thing of this is that this is the sock, I think I said in an earlier podcast, where I am trying to teach myself to knit continental style. So 
I am doing that at the same time that I'm learning to knit on a nine inch circular needle. That was one of my grandmother's in my grandmother's knitting stash that I inherited. And it's going okay. Um, jury's still out whether I love it or hate it or care one way or the other. I think, I, I don't know that I have a favorite way. Whatever sock I'm working on at the time is just sort of a, I just enjoy and I'm enjoying this method with this sock. These um, socks are being done on the, my, um, Carbon's circular magic loop method style. So, half finished object, almost a half finished object. Who knows when they'll be done? But I can't cast on for my Christmas socks until these are done. So, maybe Christmas 2019? I don't know. Someday. So that's my sock knitting progress. And my sock knitting bag. As for other works in progress, I am trying to get my husband's birthday sweater done before his next birthday, which is in March. And, you know, to be fair, I didn't work on it much over the summer because he's not gonna wear it in the summer. And I worked on my uh, Rhinebeck sweater and my scarf and other things and socks and stuff. But it's time. He needs his sweater. So I finished the back. That was where I was... Last time I talked about this, I had not finished the back. I have now cast off and blocked the back. So I have the back and both fronts and one sleeve done. I need the second sleeve and then putting it together. This is the Longfellow sweater, which is a Brooklyn tweed pattern, I think decide, designed by Michelle, Michelle Wang. Um, but you can find it on their website. It's a very classic, modern, I call it the Mr. Rogers cardigan. It's just a good basic cardigan with modern uh, shaping. So it's a little slimmer fit, which my husband is, um, likes that slimmer fit. And it's made out of loft in the almanac color, which is a really pretty blue. Oh, there. That might be, now you can kind of see the blue that it is. It's a kind of a, a worn blue jean kind of blue, so it's really nice, and I think it will go with a lot of things. Um, I think I showed you last time the leather buttons I have for it, as well as the elbow patches that he wants on it. So stay tuned. Hopefully going to wrap this one up by the end of the Christmas knitting season, hopefully. Other than that, the only other knitting to show you is my Inara, uh, no, not Inara, my Linnea, Linnea, not Linnea, it's not spelled right for Linnea, my Linnea shawl. I've been working on that. This was my airplane knitting on my trip to Rhinebeck um, because I took my socks. And then I got on the plane and realized that the seat was about this wide and I had my knitting bag and I needed my phone out to decide what kind of heel I was going to put in and yeah, whatever. So then I put my socks away and I just knit on this because it was, it's at a place where you, you, I have this part memorized, get through those stitches and then it's just plain old knit and then a little thing at the end and it goes pretty quickly. So I am just about at the point where I'm done with the increasing and then I put the edging on it. The edging I think comes down this way and it becomes a triangular shawl which I'm hoping will just drape nicely around like my other one. And it um, has been a pretty easy pattern. There is, there's always one mistake. And I didn't notice the mistake until way after I had passed it. And I've decided that by the time it's bundled up on my neck, hopefully nobody will find it. And I'm going to leave it there. 
there's only so much time in the day to knit and the chances are good that if I pick back to that spot where the mistake is, I will make some other mistake and then set it aside because I can't deal with it right now and then it'll sit there forever waiting for me to deal with it and I don't want that to happen. So for this forward progress is more important. If this were the sweater for my husband and I made a mistake then I'd want to knit that back and make it right. But with all that lace that by the time you by the time you wrap it around and everything, I don't think, don't think I'll notice it. So that's what I've been working on. Um, doesn't seem like a lot of progress in the amount of time it's been since the last podcast, but that's because I'm back to work full time during the school year, and that's been keeping me busy. So going forward, um, my middle son. And his girlfriend will arrive home on Tuesday night for the Thanksgiving week. And then my eldest son and, of course, his girlfriend will be in and out. They live nearby, so it's um, they'll just be in and out. And we also have another set of friends coming in to town late Thursday night to spend a few days with us. So this next week is full of fun and exciting things. Lots of people to do stuff with, and probably very little knitting will get done. A lot of eating. Um, my fridge right now has eight pie crust doughs set aside, sectioned off and set aside. I've made a bunch of cookies, sugar cookies, for the guys to decorate. The cranberries are sitting in the fridge waiting for me to make them into sauce. We typically um, go to visit with family in a town about an hour and 15, about an hour and 10, an hour and 15 minutes from here. So Thursday morning we'll get up, we'll finish putting together whatever we need to put together, drive with our food contributions that were there, and enjoy the day and then drive home. So I'm not responsible for the turkey or the dressing. I can just, um, they always just say bring whatever, bring whatever you want. And I usually pull the family and we try to bring enough to compensate for the fact that we're also bringing the five of us and two girlfriends. So there'll be seven of us going over there. And some of them eat a lot of food. <laughs> My youngest one in particular will eat a lot of food. So. The husband has requested a traditional pumpkin pie with no no fancifications. The youngest son wants pecan pie. The middle son and his girlfriend are in the mood for a cookie baking, so I think they're going to do a couple kinds of cookies while they're here. I like... Uh, oh, the husband also requested... Um, he requested a um, cherry slash apple pie. So we will try to make that happen as well. Although I'm having a hard time finding pie cherries. I don't use a lot of pre-made pie fillings. I like to make everything from scratch and just finding tart pie cherries has been difficult um, lately. So have to figure that mystery out. Um, yeah corn. I like to make a corn casserole and then it's really important for me to have fresh cranberry sauce so I'm making the fresh cranberry sauce and I don't know we'll just usually I make some sort of appetizer kind of thing um, really vehicles for eating cream cheese is what they end up being some sort of dip or some sort of we've done jalapeno poppers we've done we've done different things over the years and I have not yet been inspired by what we're going to do this year so have to figure that out in the next day or so and then my students on Friday were supposed to take a field test that was online for um, math 3 and it didn't work so then we were left with by the time we decided that it wasn't going to work and that um, they called the 
administration called it and said, okay, we're not going to do it. We still had, you know, 70 minutes left of class and their next class session was supposed to be a unit test. Well, I couldn't give them the unit test that day. That was kind of unfair. So I said, well, here are some online links for practice problems. See what you can do. And then I offhandedly mentioned that we were like a thousand or so problems away from hitting the 20,000 mark for the number of problems solved through this program that our system uses that year. And somebody said, well, what if we get to that 20,000 mark today? Will you bring us pie? <laughs> and we are working on circles right now. So we've been working with radian mode and pi, pi pi, not pie pi. And so these students thought it would be perfectly appropriate to have pi to celebrate working on problems about pi and conned me into the fact that if they could get to 20,000 by the end of the block, then I should owe them all pumpkin pie, which they got to 20,000 by the end of the block, so I am trying to figure out a way <laughs> to make enough uh, pumpkin pie for 30-something students. And I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make take the pie dough and cut in little circles and put in a little mini muffin tin and then put the pie filling in it and they can each have a little, a little mini muffin sized pie of their own because otherwise I'd have to make how many pies would I have to make to get 31 slices of pie? I'm a math teacher, I should be able to figure that out. But how many, how many slices is reasonable out of a pie? Like, if I cut 10 slices out of a pie, that's still three pies. I can't do that. Not enough time. Who knows, I may be making three pumpkin pies tonight. Four pumpkin pies tonight. Yeah, four pumpkin pies at eight slices per pie. 32 slices of pie. Thing is, I'm not a pumpkin fan. So, anyway, I'm just wittering on now. So, um, if you are in the United States and are planning to celebrate Thanksgiving, I wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. I know our Canadian friends celebrated their Canadian Thanksgiving back in October. So we will have um, three days off this week for Thanksgiving. Then I think we have three weeks of school before winter break. So it'll go quickly, I know. But if you are celebrating Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for stopping in. And hopefully... I will find time to knit something worth showing you, and we'll see you probably, probably not until the new year at the rate I'm going, but maybe, who knows. But thank you if you did stop by to watch. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye.